Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're all doing all right. My name is Matt Steinmetz, and I'm here at the Lexington County Public Library for an evening with Tom Poland. We're going to be talking about his book, Carolina Bays, Wild, Mysterious, and Majestic Landforms. Welcome. I'm glad that you can be with us virtually. A couple of housekeeping things I'd like to talk about. Everybody's microphone and camera is turned off for this program. But you can ask questions, and I will relay them to, to Tom. If you click on the little question mark icon, you can type a question in there, and you can send it to me, and I'll pass them on to Tom. I'll try not to interrupt him when he's on a roll. On your computers also, you should see a gray bar that you can move up and down, and you can make Tom and me smaller or bigger, and that will also make the presentation that he's showing currently larger or smaller as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Tom Poland. Tom's work has appeared in magazines throughout the South. Among his recent books are Car Classic Carolina Road Trips from Columbia, Georgia Lina and Southland as we knew it, and Reflections of South Carolina, Volume 2, uh, Swamp Gravy, Georgia's official folk life drama stage, his play Solid Ground. He writes a weekly column for newspapers and journals in Georgia and South Carolina about the South, its people, traditions, lifestyle, and changing culture, and speaks to groups across South Carolina and Georgia. Tom grew up in Lincoln County, Georgia, and graduated from the University of Georgia. We'll try not to hold that against him. He lives in Columbia, South Carolina, where he writes about Georgia Lina, his name for Eastern Georgia and South Carolina, his new book. Carolina Bay's Wild, Mysterious, and Majestic Landforms is available through USC Press. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and let him give us a talk and show us some pictures. Okay, Matt. Thank you. And thank everybody for joining me today. Excuse me for a second. <clears throat> the Carolina Bays are a very fascinating place. Um, this book, if you can see it, represents 30,000 miles, three states, six years in the field and another almost full year production working on the manuscript working with the press and its editors catching typos and all that kind of thing so it's a beautiful book because these are beautiful places the carolina bays are very mysterious places you have seen them but you didn't realize what you were seeing in most cases if i have 20 people in a room and i ask them who knows what a carolina bay is maybe one will raise their hand. They're very strange, and I came into contact with them around 1982 when I was working with the South Carolina DNR, as it's called today, uh, film section. A gentleman in Camden, South Carolina, an attorney named Henry Savage had come out with a book about the mysterious Carolina Bays, and he thought maybe they had been created by meteorite bombardments, which is a fascinating thing to think about because I was a kid of the Sputnik era. I remember when Sputnik went up in 1958, 59, thereabouts. I was fascinated with anything to do with outer space. And the idea that meteorites had bombarded this part of the world and gouged out uh, craters like you see on the moon fascinated me. So in 82, we decided to do a book about the Carolina Bays. And this shot you're looking at, by the way, here on the cover, that's down in South Georgia, near Valdosta and Lakeland, Georgia. That's Banks Lake, which is a Carolina Bay. Um, they have all kinds of strange names. Some do have bay attached to them, like Woods Bay. Um, it's a Carolina Bay. And the name itself is really kind of strange. And as I wrote in the book, it's somewhat misfortunate because it's misleading. The Carolina Bays are not just in North and South Carolina. They exist from New Jersey, to the Florida Panhandle in the Atlantic Coastal Plain. They're very easy to spot from the air. <clears throat> Here you can see that they're all elliptical shape. They're parallel. They're oriented northwest to southeast. When you drive by one, if you drive by the end that has the, the Pond Cypress Swamp, you'll look at it and you'll think, oh yeah, that's a swamp right there. Well, maybe not. If you fly over them, which I have done, 
you'll see that they're perfectly elliptical almost in many cases and aligned parallel. And it was this kind of uh, orientation that led people to believe something like a meteorite bombardment had created them. That theory has never been proven to be true. They're mysterious because science has yet to come to any conclusive consensus as to what created them. There's a good theory out there as to how the bays were oriented, and that's the wind and wave action theory that Raymond Kazarowski uh, did here at USC in 1977, thereabouts, with his DH, uh, PhD dissertation. He said that over time, wind action and prevailing winds would sculpt out this elliptical shape and would pile sands up on their south southeastern edge, which is some of the, what uh, characterizes some of the larger bays. They'll have that sand rim. So what's really interesting about them is this. No one knows what created the depressions that held the rainwater in the first place. Your typical Carolina Bay has no source of water, no spring, no stream, no creek. It collects seasonal rains. And as we both know, as we all know right now, it's been a wet spring, so the bay should be really full, which will make the frogs and amphibians happy. What you're looking at right here is a LIDAR image. That's light imaging distance and ranging. It's a laser technology that sends 16,000 pulses of lasers a second that penetrates canopies and it measures and sort of creates a relief map of what the bay looks like. It's highly detailed and it's a very great tool for studying the bays. Right here you can see there are one, two, three bays and some smaller ones all parallel. That's one of their hallmarks. You'll have bays within bays. So it's really a confusing situation when people start trying to prove that their theory is the way they were created. So far, only Kazarowski is the one that's been accepted uh, widely. There are three ways to see a bay. You can fly over it, you can drive by it, or you can walk into it. You know, a lot of people say, I'm not going in one of those bays because of alligators, snakes. They're there in most cases. But really, the danger to me and others is usually insects, uh, ticks, spiders sometimes, and stinging insects. The, the whole uh, seven, six years that I was in the bays in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, the only problem I had was I got stung by wasps across my face, uh, came across a nest, hit it accidentally, and they jumped all over me. Right here in the foreground, you have uh, pitcher plants. Those are carnivorous plants, and they're really fascinating. They feel like styrofoam. They rattle in the fall when they've dried out. They have beautiful colors, different subspecies and so forth. You'll notice the colors of the, uh, of the grasses, you get these zonations, these colored, colored grasses that are neighbors to each other, ecotones where habitats of different kinds bump up against each other. It's a very lush environment in the spring, wildflowers, lush grasses, sedges, a lot of butterflies, birds. Uh, it's a beautiful place to, to see. And Red Bluff Bay is in the Francis Marion uh, National Forest off Highway 45 between Jamestown and McClellanville. It's very remote. When you go there, difficult to get to. You go down up. Highway 45, you turn off to another county road, you turn onto a dirt road, and then you turn onto a forest ATV trail and go about a mile in there. You know? And you're remote. It's, you're, it's you versus the world when you get in these places. <clears throat> Another bay you can go to that's easy if you uh, get very interested in these bays, and some of my readers have because I've heard from, is Woods Bay over in Atlanta. I call it Easy Man's Bay because it has a little parking lot you can go to. There was a park one time. It's a heritage reserve. You can walk out upon a boardwalk. You can get deep into the bay that way. You can drive down a highway and see the sand rim. It's an easy bay to explore, and that's in Atlanta. Hey, Tom, I had a question from a viewer. Mary yes. Alice wanted to know if there are, any, are there any restrictions to walking in these bays? Well, <clears throat> I would say not really. Uh, you certainly want to be careful. I talk about how to go into a bay, even telling you what to wear. Um, you know, I never saw any litter in a, in a bay ever. Never saw any of man's litter. I think maybe one time I saw a birthday balloon that had come down from some party somewhere, you know. You just want to uh, respect them, uh, walk in, leave footsteps only, as they say, and enjoy what you see. Some of them are um, perhaps off limits. I'm not sure 
it, by and large, but most of them that are open to the public have um, boardwalks in areas, and they have plenty of signage up telling you what to expect and what you can and can't do. That's a good question. So here we have a photograph from the 1930s of Horry County. The Fairchild Aviation Company had been commissioned to survey the county. And until this time, no one knew these elliptical depressions existed. So when they saw them, and I've flown over the same area, it is amazing. It seemed to them that some otherworldly force had created what looked like a meteorite bombardment. You know, these elliptical depressions, all parallel. If you took a handful of marbles and threw it into a mud bank, you'd get a similar effect. <clears throat> so this really shocked the world. And it was a great bit of attention that devoted to uh, Horry County. And as Franklin Roosevelt's Department of Agriculture did more surveys in the coastal plain, they discovered they were everywhere, from New Jersey down to the Florida Panhandle. And they're, they're very, very interesting places. They have little fellows like this, the marble salamander that live in there. Here he is on some moss. The salamanders and the frogs are great citizens of the bays. The seasonal rains come and go. Steve Bennett, who worked with me and Robert Clark, the photographer on this book, wrote a wonderful foreword in which he talks about the value of temporary water. The bays are filled by rains. Sometimes in dry seasons, the rains disappear, the bays dry out. This is a good thing for frogs and amphibians because no predatory fish populations can get established. That means it's sort of a haven for them. Fish love the eggs of frogs and salamanders. It's kind of like uh, jello to them. So these little fellas get in there and they're able to breed <clears throat> and live quite comfortably. Also, if anything is wrong in an environment, and Steve could speak to this much better than I can, amphibians are your first warning sign. They can always tell you that something's going on wrong with the environment because they're very much affected by it. Marble salamanders, uh, lots of other salamanders, leopard frogs, all kinds of interesting animals in the bays. And when you go to one and you stand there quietly and just listen, sort of blend in with the environment, the bird song is incredible. Lots of bird life, lots of insect life, lots of frogs singing. It's quite a chorus, quite a concert. <clears throat> Here's a picture plant colony in autumn. I want to say this is at Red Bluff Bay again. It may be at Florida Bay, which is in the uh, Francis Marion National Forest. And Florida Bay is also known as Wombal Bay. That was where I got attacked by a wasp. It was not the best day for me. But look how beautiful these are. They're multicolored. They're very common. They're not protected. They're, they're not endangered, unlike Venus flytraps. And the thing about them is they're a beautiful plant and it's a death trap to insects. If you're an insect that detects the fragrance coming off pitcher plants, you're gonna land on top of it. You're gonna crawl down the throat of the pitcher plant, which it has some hairs that sort of interlock and point downwards like steps, which makes it easy for the insect. Well, when they get to the bottom where that nectar is, they find out that it's actually acid, <clears throat> it's much like stomach acid. And now it's time to flee. So they turn to go out and those downward pointing hairs now are like the crossbars in a jail cell. You can't get out. The insects will tire themselves to the point that they get exhausted and they drop into the acid and they become the very thing they thought they were gonna drink. Uh, one day in one of these bays, I think it was Florida Bay, I took my pocket knife out, it was autumn, pitcher plants were dead. And I cut one loose at the base, and then I cut the section open where the insects had all been accumulating, and it was like a fine soil. It was as if the pitcher do capture insects is because they live in nutrient-poor soil, and this is a supplemental way for them to get the nutrients that they need. A little later in the show, you're going to see that spiders have got wise to this and they try to catch insects at the top of these pitcher plants. If I were a florist, I would, I would love to sell these in my shop. They're beautiful, just beautiful plants. And a bay is beautiful in all the seasons, especially fall. Here you have a cypress up at Jones Lake in Bladen County, North Carolina. <clears throat> Bladen County is rich with bays. It has a lot of bays up around Elizabethan, North Carolina. 
the fog was coming up that morning. We had uh, spent the night earlier in a tent, Robert Clark and I have. And I didn't point out, Robert Clark is the wonderful photographer behind all these great images you see. There were actually four of us in this book. <clears throat> One who's no longer with us, James Dickey, wrote a nice essay called East of Eden, which was in the very first book that Robert Clark, Steve Bennett, myself did with James Dickey. And kind of interestingly enough, this last book we've done on, on the nature, natural aspects of the bays in North and South Carolina and other states, Georgia included, involved the same four people again. I was able to get permission from uh, Mr. Dickey's family to use East of Eden again because it was a perfect message for preserving places that are wild. And so we had the original team of Bennett, Poland, Clark, and Dickey reunited for this book. <clears throat> that meant a lot to me. But these bays are beautiful places and they change through the seasons, foggy, cold sometimes, tropical, beautiful places. This is Dry Bay at Savannah River site. <clears throat> now, a long time ago, I got in an argument with some of the people I worked with at DNR, which used to be called South Carolina Wildlife and Marine Resources Department. I wanted to do a story on Savannah River site because it's such a wonderful place as nature goes. It's also the place where there are nuclear um, reactors that made weapons material back during the Cold War. <clears throat> so we couldn't, go, we couldn't agree to do the story, but this is at Savannah River site. And here's what's cool about Savannah River site. It's 310 square miles of territory. No one can just go in. When you pass through there, you go through guard stations. As you well know, you have to have security clearance to go there and visit and do things like we did. When Robert and I went to this particular uh, site for all the bays, and they have 300 bays there, we could not be alone. We had to be accompanied at all times by uh, someone from the University of Georgia Ecology Lab. Matthew, it's nice to note that Georgia has the Ecology Lab there, not USC or Clemson. That was a coup they pulled off a long time ago. But I love the place because it's, it's really a wild, protected place. And think about this. If Savannah Riverside had never existed, how many golf courses, how many strip malls, Walmarts, roads, how, many, how much of that would we have had in this beautiful place that's really a paradise? I wrote a story about it that was in a magazine uh, called My Atomic Paradise. There's a bay at Savannah River site that's in the Guinness Book of World Records. It's the longest continuing study of amphibians in the world. That's pretty significant. And yet, just a mile away, you pass by a reactor. I think I can't remember if it's P or R. And it's a very foreboding thing, those, those reactors. They look like something you would see from a movie. It's like an iceberg. What you see above ground is just one-eighth of it. Below the ground is seven-eighths of block-type buildings, very imposing, dark. You can't take pictures of them. Um, when I was doing the research, I found out that one of these reactors in 1964 had leaked some water, radioactive water, into the groundwater. <clears throat> President uh, Johnson decommissioned it. They came in and they filled it with cement and welded the steel door shut. And I think it's to stay that way for 14,000 years. So it gives you cause pause for reflecting on the uh, severity of the plants then and the reactors. But you have all this beautiful wildlife surrounding them. Rainbow Bay, Dry Bay, this bay was not dry very long. As you can see, there was a storm coming, but it was a big, big bay, a big bay. And here we go with a spider who has learned that if he stays here long enough and makes a little web across the uh, top of the pitcher plant, the opening of the throat, in due time, he'll catch himself some dinner. Now, when you get up in the morning at dawn, and most people don't do what Robert and I do, <laughs> we'll get up three or four in the morning, drive to one of these bays two, two hours away, set up, take pictures as the sun comes up. When the sun comes up on a bay that's heavy with dew, all the pitcher plants are sparkling like diamonds but from the dew that's caught in the spider webs. Uh, sometimes, of course, we spend the night on the road and we don't have to go that far. But it is an amazing thing to see the number of spider webs in a Carolina bay. They're rich with insect life. Now, there was a controversy I came across doing my research between um, specialists that study these things. Some thought it was pretty bad that the uh, spiders were covering the throat of the 
a pitcher plant with a web that would intercept its its food, its its meals, and uh, it was hijacking, so to, so to speak, the uh, insects headed down that throat. But they did a bunch of studies, and some other people came back and counteracted all this, saying, "No, spiders eat, and they're like any other animal that eats; they defecate." And their waste matter, which is highly uh, rich in nitrogen, ends up going down into the plant, into that little fuel area, that little dirt that this got. And so maybe it's a great example of symbiosis where, you know, two organisms are benefiting each other. But it's an amazing thing to see just how many spiders there are in a bay. Um, in one of the bays where I was, and I wrote this in chapter four, there's a, a chapter that my favorite chapter is called Notes from the Field, Dispatches from the Field which I take about 24 bays, and I put you there in my shoes. You see what I see. You hear what I hear. You smell what I smell, the wildflowers, the sedges, the cypress oil. It's really a rich and fragrant place, orchids, wild orchids. And uh, <clears throat> one day I was there at Wombaugh Bay in the Francis Marion Forest where I had been stung by a wasp, and a wasp went down the pitcher plant right near me. I couldn't believe it. I watched him do it. He could not get out. I thought, well, maybe you're the one that stung me. might serve you right. But then I got to feel sorry for it, and I thought, because for about 20 minutes, this wasp struggled trying to get out of that pitcher plant. And then it got very quiet. I looked over at it, expecting to see him down in the bottom, and he shot out with a burst of energy, and he escaped. I think what happened was he was a little bit too big to fall too far to get trapped by those downward pointing hairs. They're really interesting places because if you sit among a, a colony of pitcher plants for very long and just watch them, the abundance of insects flocking to them is staggering. They really call them in, really call them in. This is Banks Lake again in Lakeland, Georgia. A lot of bays and the water they had attracted men to build things alongside them like mills and whatnot to, to take advantage of the water. This particular morning was cold and it was very um, heavy dew, had a little bit of fog rising. <clears throat> it was a beautiful place to be. And the only thing that marred the morning was at Banks Lake, they have a boat ramp. And there was a fisherman went out that morning by himself, left his feathery wake across the face of the bay. And I thought to myself, you know, all the bays we've been to, We've never seen anything like this happen. But Banks Lake is very large, and it's a very beautiful place, not too far from Valdosta, Georgia. When I was working on the book, I took this photograph, and I emailed it to my daughter, Becky, in Atlanta. I was going to have some fun with it. It was September. I said, Becky, it was late September. I said, Becky, can you believe it's snowing over here in South Carolina? She's like, God, Daddy, that's amazing. How can that be? And I said, no, it's not snow. It's white sands of a sand rim over near Bennettsville, South Carolina. And it's as white as snow. And these sands are washed up by the wave action, we think, from Kazarowski's theory of oriented wave and, and, and wind action that shapes the bays and so forth. And as we did our research, uh, we found that they were um, the, kinds of, the kind of habitat where Zeric type plants. Xeric is in Xerox. Xerox is in dry reproduce, reproduction process. They're very dry. It's a desert-like environment. The habitat there is much like desert. So you get plants living there that can adapt to that situation. It's, you don't see a lot of vegetation. You see these turkey oaks. And the turkey oak, by the way, if you don't know how it got its name, it's because its leaves resembles the footprint of a wild turkey. And that's how they got their name turkey oaks. But these were wonderful places where Native Americans, or Indians as we say, uh, camped out on the sands. It was an interesting place. You had water, food, a lot of things that they needed right there in one spot. And as I understand it, some of the archaeological digs have really, uh, uh, you know, uncovered some great and interesting things that reveal to what extent uh, ancient men here uh, lived on the edges of these dunes, on these uh, rims rather. Now here, here we have a twisted cypress in the savannah of the grassy portion of Florida Bay in the Francis Marion Forest. And I was talking with Steve Bennett about this. These cypress remind me just remotely of the acacia in Africa 
And many times in this book, uh, I use the theme that when you step into a wild, undisturbed Carolina Bay, it's like snapping your fingers and ending up in some aspect of Africa. It's wild. It's beautiful. We couldn't, I couldn't understand exactly why the canopy are twisted. And uh, we just think it happens somehow. It's just something that happens. I had thought that maybe the winds did it because it's not protected by buffering trees like you might see on the horizon there on the rim of this bay. But it gives them that look and feel that you're in an exotic place. And so many, many times I compared going into a bay, much like going into Africa. Here, here you have the grassy savanna, these trees. How, how old would you think they are from looking at them? I know you can't get much frame of reference. They're not that big. But I found out from talking to you as forest personnel who had cored some of these trees. They're 400 years old. That's 400-year-old trees you're looking at. Here's a beautiful place near Sumter, Dazelle, Dazelle Bay. And as I wrote in the book, Robert Clark well remembered the first time he went to Dazelle Bay, he went with Steve Bennett. And he wasn't prepared for these lush grasses and these beautiful buttress trees. And Robert said, you know, it was so beautiful. I couldn't believe it. I started calling it Dazzle Bay because it dazzled me. And it is a beautiful bay. Now, we had one trip to this bay, Steve Bennett, Robert Clark, myself, and Michael Davios. Michael Davios is a Carolina Bay theorist who has an interesting theory about a comet, icy comet hitting Saginaw glacial fields up, up Michigan way. And Michael drove all night from, from um, Connecticut to meet Robert, Steve, and me at this bay. And it had been a rainy season. We went into the bay. We had not been there 20 minutes when Robert stepped into a stump hole and went eight feet under. He ruined an iPhone and a Canon camera. And we had to abort the trip. And I felt pretty bad for Michael Davios. He had driven all night just to be inside of Carolina Bay. And uh, it was a big disappointment to all of us. He did have other business in Myrtle Beach, so it wasn't like a total trip was lost. But as you can see in the springtime here, how lush they are. Here's a picture of Dazelle Bay in the fall. Kind of a haunting, misty, beautiful shot. Uh, waters are catching the light. You can see the reflections. The thing about the bays are, I don't care what season you go into them, they're beautiful places. Fall, winter, summer, spring, you always can find something interesting going on in a Carolina Bay. Uh, a lot of people ask me, where can I go see one? I said, well, all you got to do is do some Googling. You'll find out where they are. There's Ditch Pond down near Barnwell County. It has a boardwalk that you can walk out onto. It also has some of the most magnificent uh, Spanish moss I've seen anywhere. You would think you're at the coast. The Spanish moss is so heavy there. There's Woods Bay near Atlanta, which I've been uh, referring to already. I started going to Woods Bay in 1981, practicing shooting film when I was taking a job at the DNR as a cinematographer, because you could see alligators there, water lilies, wading birds, and at a boardwalk, you could set your tripod down, you know, get a good level shot. Uh, well, recently, one of my readers told me she had gone to Woods Bay and how great it was to be there. It's a very interesting place, and when you go there, there's a bonus. Another one of man's mills has been attached to Woods Bay, and it too has a lot of water that, of course, you'll see alligators and various forms of wildlife in. Question for you, Tom. Yes. One of our one of our, our viewers wanted to know if you had any sense about how many of these bays have been um, developed or have been ruined by development. I know there's no way to, to really count, but do you have a sense of, of how, how much they've been affected by development? Yes, uh, back in 78 or 79, I think it was, Steve Bennett and Dr. John Nelson did a landmark survey in which they went to many, many bays and cataloged them. And uh, I think most bays have been disturbed. It's relatively rare to find a bay that's pristine. So the answer would be a high percentage. I want to say 90%, but I'm not a numbers guy. And let me point out something else, too, while we're talking about this. number of times in the book I point out that Robert and I are not biologists, we're not naturalists, we're not scientists. We're just a photographer and a writer guy that have loved the bays for long times now, many years. And we just, we're planning a trip in July to go back to Red Bluff Bay, even though the book's done. We're going to go back, take photos. So uh, <clears throat> we try to 
make clear to people that we're not scientists or naturalists. We're just two guys that did something that a lot of people won't do. And that is we spent six years, 30,000 miles, three states, exploring bays best we could. Uh, but the, a high percentage of them have been dis, uh, disturbed. But here's the interesting thing about Carolina bays. Uh, farmers would go in and, and dig a ditch into them and drain them. And then they would timber them. You're going to see a picture in a minute that'll show what I'm talking about. They would farm them. Now, if you fly over them, even though a bay has been totally destroyed, you still see its elliptical outline, northwest to southeast. It's still there. And the amazing thing happens if you plug up that drainage ditch and let the rains just fill them up again. We'll leave them alone, and in due time, they revert back to a wild Carolina bay. They can heal themselves, much like the physician healed ourselves. They can heal themselves if we just leave them alone. So one of the uh, purposes of our book was, first of all, to raise awareness that they exist. Most people don't even know they exist. They say, what's a Carolina bay? It sounds like something on the coast, a harbor. And that's where I said the name is misfortune is an unfortunate name because they were called Carolina Bays in the 1700s by some of the early biologists, <clears throat> excuse me, because the biggest and the best ones occurred in the Carolinas. They were called bays, not because of water or impoundments, but because of the multiple common species of bay trees that grow there, red bay, laurel bay, magnolias, and so forth. So that's where you get the name Carolina Bays. It's really a misleading name. But I'd be hard pressed to come up with a better name myself. Uh, those weird, mysterious, elliptical depressions, that's a mouthful. So we're stuck with Carolina Bays, but it's a good one. This guy wouldn't argue with you. He was about six six feet long, Valdosta, Georgia, uh, at Grand Bay. He just was sunning right by a boardwalk. A few people were there that day, and they all would stop and stare at this fellow. Of course, if they need to, they can move very quickly. But that particular bay also has an observation tower about 55 feet tall. It's an old um, fire tower that they took the top out of and made a platform where you can go up and actually see across the bay. And when you look across that bay, you'll see grand, uh, great blue herons, ibises, all kinds of wading birds, gators. Uh, it was a very surreal experience we had that day. Moody Air Force Base is about three miles on the horizon. And at the same time, they played uh, taps, Reveille. A red-shouldered hawk took off and flew over the bay beneath us. We were watching this hawk fly from above, which is very unusual perspective. Kind of gave me chills. I knew a little bit about the, uh, the Air Force Base because one of my favorite writers, James Salter, had been stationed there uh, back in his time. But it's a beautiful place. It's a great place to see an aerial perspective without having to fly. Maybe one of the prettier shots in the book is, is in the um, liner pages of the book is this Anhinga taken off at Jones Lake in North Carolina. This was the same night that we had camped out in a tent. It was October. It was very cold. The tent was soaking wet with dew. We were just saturated the next morning we woke up. It was cold. Uh, we got up and drove just a short piece from where we were camping and went to the banks here. Robert went out on a little pier-like area they had. This is a state park in North Carolina. It's also a Carolina Bay. And this strange fog started building from the edges of the bay into the middle with a plume coming up. And you couldn't see through it. And at one point, <clears throat> I heard this clattering of wings and honking, and Canada geese were there taking off coming out of the fog. And later, Robert got this shot of this Anhinga at Jones Lake. Uh, North Carolina has some beautiful bays. One bay, and you can look at the map and you'll see what I mean, is the biggest bay around, Waccamaw, Lake Waccamaw. Lake Waccamaw is a very unusual Carolina bay. It's big, it's shallow, it's clear, and in many areas, it's got houses around the edge of it, just like people like to build on the edges of Lake Murray and Clarks Hill Lake in Georgia. You know, they want that water view. At the other end is a state park, so it's protected. And 
The thing about Lake Waccamaw that makes it so unusual is the headwaters for the Waccamaw River that flows down into South Carolina. So that's, that's a highly unusual thing that a bay would be the headwaters of a river. But that's the case with Johns Lake. Now, this is what most people always ask about. Don't you see snakes? Yes, we see snakes. We don't worry about snakes. Now, I try to tell people all the time here in Columbia, Irmo, back home in Georgia where my family is, please don't kill every snake you see just because you think it's poisonous. Most of the time, you're killing a snake that's harmless. This is cane brake rattler, also known as head shaped like an arrowhead. You spot that head, you know you're dealing with a venomous species, a pit viper, but they're beautiful animals. Now this particular shoot, Robert took this shot, as you can see he's head on with the snake. I was to this side of the snake with my camera, watching it, taking a picture of it, and Robert kept getting closer and closer to the snake with his camera, and I saw the snake's muscles start to tense up. I said, Robert, I think you better back off, man. I uh, don't think that snake's getting too comfortable with you right now. But they're beautiful animals, and uh, when you hear them rattle, it's not really a rattle. It's more like an electric razor, a buzzer. Uh, they're gorgeous animals. Uh, somebody saw a picture that I'd taken of one of these snakes. They said, oh, man, they make a great belt or a pair of boots. I hate to think about that. But they're really beautiful animals, and they fill a vital role in nature, uh, eliminating pests mice and so forth. Every part of nature works with other parts. It is all essential to make a great machine, so to speak. Uh, we like seeing snakes, corn snakes, cotton. And we never had a problem once with a snake. First of all, you're too big for them to eat. They know that. They hear you coming, they're going to get out of your way. So usually it's not a problem. And I, I do know that people step on them and get bitten and people do die. But it's very, how many people, let me ask you this, you ask yourself, how many people do I know that died from a snake bite? I bet you the answer is zero. Here we go with a picture of two, maybe three bays here that have been uh, disturbed, as the uh, environmentalists and biologists like to say, they've been drained. You can see where ditches have come into them. A highway has crossed one. They've been timbered and turned into farmland. Not a very pretty sight. If you go to Woods Bay in Atlanta, you'll come by a little marquee that shows Woods Bay and its neighboring bay, Dials Bay. Dials Bay looks like this. Woods Bay looks like a rich, verdant jewel of wildlife, green, fertile, nothing like this. But if these bays were to be plugged up and left alone in due time, they would bring themselves back. So, you know, I've seen bays converted to golf courses, highways across them. Um, there was this mentality for a long time, it still exists in some circles, that a swamp is a worthless place. Well, we certainly know better than that now. A swamp is a beautiful, valuable place that cleanses water of pollution. It traps heavy metals out. It gives a great habitat to amphibians and other species. You know, it's, it's really... A, an oasis in some sense, although uh, Becky Lee, one of the uh, environmentalists, uh, wetlands ecologists at Samantha Recite, cautioned me, says, I'll never refer to a bay as an oasis because a lot of animals come into its edges and from nearby forests, and they, they make it part of their life cycle. So it's not like it's in a desert, isolated. It's connected to the surrounding habitat, which is why also if you timber up to the bay and then stop, you think you're doing a good thing. Maybe you're not. You might be cutting off access to the bay that enabled animals to ha enjoy some degree of cover and security, you know, migrating during breeding season, for example, into the bay's waters. But this is this is what they look like when they've been uh, timbered, drained, and so forth. If you fly over them, you can still see this elliptical shape. We had a question, Tom, about whether or not, are you aware of any protections for the bays, um, any federal protection or state protections or any of that? Well, the heritage preserves are protected, of course, like the Janet Harrison Heritage Preserve up near um, Mineta. And, of course, other bays like Woods Bay are protected, and some of them are uh, Ditch Pond, you know, are protected. The sad thing is that when they did the Wetlands Clean Water Act, 
they did not include Carolina Bays in it because they don't have any running water in or out of them. It was a tremendous oversight. And uh, there's some efforts being made, I'm told, and we address this in the book, to correct that. So that was a really, really big blunder, you know, to, to not include them in this freshwater protection. Uh, so they're vulnerable. Yeah, they're vulnerable themselves. Yeah, that's a good question. Do you have any other questions? Not right now. Okay. Well, keep the questions coming. Leopard frogs, um, all kinds of amphibians. Um, it's astounding if you just go there on a summer evening and listen to the frogs singing. Now, when you hear it at a park or at a lake or a farm pond, that's a pretty good little concert, too. But in a bay, it's astounding, man. And I'll tell you something else about the bays as far as sound goes that really struck me. And I wrote about this recently for a, another magazine. <clears throat> in just about every bay we went into, we weren't in there five minutes. We would hear the call of the Bob White, the Bob White quail. That beautiful, clear, pure tone, that dulcet whistle by Bob White. I hadn't heard that in years over in Georgia, in the country where I grew up, because of habitat loss. But in the Carolina Bays, nearly every bay we were in, we heard the call of the Bob White quail. And I thought, man, that's pretty impressive to know that quail are in these, these bays. It's kind of like a, a stronghold for them, a holdout, a place they can go to now. Uh, you know, we've destroyed a lot of their habitat through the years, and that's why you have the, uh, I don't know if you call them plantations, but the quail hunting clubs and places where they have pen-reared birds and they release them and, you you know, you go shoot the birds. This is the real deal, the real deal. Frogs and quail in Carolina Bays. Here we have the monarch butterfly on um, milkweed. We took this shot, I believe it was in... Um, Ori County, monarchs coming through, milkweed. It's uh, it's there in the bays. It might have been at Wamba Bay. Now that I think about it, you got to remember I was on a bunch of bays, and uh, sometimes they sort of run together. But they're all beautiful. They're all unique, and they're all valuable. So the insect life ranges, you know, across a broad spectrum too. Stinging wasp, ticks, yeah, uh, chiggers, butterflies, but the orchids and uh, other wildflowers in there are amazing. I think you're going to see a shot in a minute of, a, of, a, of an orchid. Now here's the star of the show, the Venus flytrap. Science fiction has gotten a hold of this plant. There have been some movies made back in the older days when they had these grade B type films that would show car-sized Venus flytraps capturing and eating people. What you're looking at here is something about the size of your thumbnail. It's a specialized hinged leaf. Charles Darwin called it the most wondrous plant, and he was right. Think about it. Here's a plant, a leaf, that can capture living things and consume them. How does it do it? Pretty amazing. First, let me tell you this. It's very hard to find a Venus flytrap. You've never found them before. Robert and I went to Ori, uh, we went to Ori County, to Lewis Ocean Bay, with uh, a professor, Dr. Jim Lukin from Coastal Carolina. He was our guide and he left us, uh, he, he, he sort of showed us how to find Venus flytraps. And then he said, I've got to go to a meeting. You guys are on your own. Let me know how it goes. Well, we wandered around and after about 40 minutes, we started finding them. And once you start finding them, you sort of see the signs of where they might be. Well, poachers know this too. And they go in there and dig them up you can go on the internet and you'll see where you can buy Venus flytraps here and there. It's against the law. They're endangered. North Carolina has done, has done something pretty special, though. They've licensed certain greenhouses and growers to provide Venus flytraps to the public. So you don't need to go have some guy dig them up for you. You can order them online legally. Now, how do they do their thing? First of all, it's sort of a heart-shaped leaf. And it's red. It's beautiful. It opens up. You can see the hinges, little spines along the edges that do this number. <clears throat> when something falls or lands inside the open Venus flytrap leaf, the plant has to know that it's something that offers nutrition. For example, if a little flake of pine bark fell down in this 
Venus flytrap right here. Nothing would happen. Nothing. How does it know? If a fly lands in there and starts moving around, he's going to get caught. And here's what works. Here's how it does its magic. Inside each Venus flytrap are six little trigger hairs, very tiny. They're like warning devices. When something hits one, like that flake of pine bark, that's it. But when a fly gets in there and he hits one, if he hits the same hair again or another trigger hair, then a 20-second timer starts ticking down. The plant knows that something is moving inside it because it's touched two of the trigger hairs or it's touched one trigger hair twice. At the end of 20 seconds, it's caught. Go to YouTube and Google Venus flytraps in action and you'll see this. It's, it's an amazingly quick thing. And then, of course, the plant digests the fly or the insect. It could be a small frog even. And in due time, the leaf will turn black and fall off, and another one will take its place. Now, the interesting thing about this plant is it has a long stalk for the flower when it uh, needs pollination. And that long stalk takes the pollinating the pollinators far away from the leaves that might catch it and eat it so the plant's looking out for itself it's using the uh, insects as a source of food but it's also also using them as a way to perpetuate the species and pollinate it so it's an ingenious way that nature works i love the venus flytrap and so the next day when i got back to columbia i called dr jim lucan and i thanked him for taking us there and showing us how to find the uh, venus flytraps and then he said well let me ask you something I said, yeah. Did you see any black bears? I said, no, should we? He said, you were in the thickest concentration of black bears in South Carolina. They have about 300 there in that particular part of the, of the coast, Lewis Ocean Bay. The other thing that's amazing is that you can be in this Carolina Bay with all this rich wilderness, wildflowers, Venus flytraps, black bears, and Myrtle Beach is just not that far away. It's like heaven and hell in one spot. Here's the yellow fringe orchid. <clears throat> this was down near uh, Francis Mary National Forest. Um, beautiful, beautiful orchid. There are other species of orchids that grow in the bays. Lots of wildflowers. There are really beautiful places in the spring. You'll see just ton tons of meadow beauties, butterflies. Um, I always felt that when I'd go into one of these bays, I would come out a lot calmer more relaxed and it never failed to happen that way we did have one uh experience that we regret <clears throat> we were going into the francis mary national forest on the way to uh Wamba bay one one summer afternoon a tremendous storm struck the rain was coming down in torrents and on my back bumper was a log truck trying to eat me up about that time we looked to the right and we saw what we thought was the sun coming up it was a pine tree on fire that had been struck by lightning. And that was a great shot we should have gotten, but we didn't for two reasons. The log truck and the rain, there was really no place to pull over. <clears throat> but if we could have gotten that shot, it would have made it into the book because wildfires and the way they clean out the bays, sort of like a control burn, are great things. You know, it used to be considered that all fires were bad. We know they're not bad now. So the U.S. Forest Service will go into the bays periodically and have a, a control burn to let the, the natural grasses come up that are native there and keep the invasive plants out and keep the, uh, the, the bay healthy, so to speak. It was on that particular day, I think, that we saw this orchid. So we saw uh, a tree on fire and an orchid all in the same site there in a space of about 30 minutes in the Carolina Bay. This is an anhinga that we photographed at one of the bays. And, uh, He's sort of bidding us goodbye here because we're going to end this session right now, see if you've got some more questions. We've got a few minutes. The anhinga is a very special bird. It's very similar to the cormorant. Cormorant has a hooked beak. The anhinga has a spear-like beak. They're also known as water, water turkeys and snake birds because they have a, a way of hunting fish in that they dive under water and use their long neck and, and spear-like bill to catch fish. And once they've caught their limit so to speak they'll go sit up on a tree all in their plumage and they get soaking wet 
So when you see these, my daughter Becky saw one on the way to work one day. And she told me she's dead. I saw the scariest thing. That. I saw the, about seven or eight of these birds with their black wings held open like this. I said, oh, you saw anhingas or cormorants. And I told them what they were. <clears throat> it's kind of a majestic thing to see, almost like a deity, like some small god, the way they hold themselves. But they're part of the ecosystem, too, out there. And it's a great, great place to see all these animals, all these insects, all these flowers in a Carolina Bay. The name may not fit like I wished it did. Carolina Bay, no, they're in New Jersey, Maryland, Georgia, Florida. They're not just in the Carolinas, but remember, we have the biggest and the best ones in North and South Carolina. And all you got to do, if you want to see one, is go to Google Earth and look for the elliptical parallel oriented northwest to southeast depressions known as Carolina Bays. Before I go, I do want to discuss a few theories of origin because we've only talked about um, meteorite bombardments and Kazarowski's theory. <clears throat> there have been some crazy theories proposed to uh, talk about Carolina Bays. Let me get you back to that shot that's got them oriented here so you can see what I'm talking about. Giant beaver dams ancient whale nesting grounds. Some of these theories are rather ridiculous. They don't really explain a whole lot. Michael Davios's theory is pretty interesting. He, he thinks an icy comet hit the Saginaw Glacial Fields, but it always comes down to this one sort of deal killer. They're not always the same age. If a cataclysmic celestial event had created all the bays at one time, then they would have about the same age, and they don't. There's some interesting studies still going on, and uh, people like Dr. Chris Moore are really studying these bays, and they can tell us a lot more about them than we than we can understand. Uh, certainly a guy like me and Robert, we're just a photographer, writer. But they are fascinating places when you consider they're one of the world's more mysterious landforms. Science cannot tell you precisely what put them here, and they're right here in our backyard. So... What I would encourage you to do, of course, is buy the book, but you don't really have to do that. Just Google Carolina Bays, see where some are near you. They're in Richland County. They're in South Carolina, across the coastal plain, uh, back in Georgia, North Carolina. Uh, you don't have to drive too far. If you want to go to Easy Man's Bay, and that's what I call Woods Bay, it's over here, Atlanta, you know, near Sumter County, and it's a great place to uh, spend a day. We had, a question, we had a question from a viewer who, who asked if you could tell us a little bit more about Steve Bennett. Steve Bennett. <clears throat> He's a proud University of Georgia graduate, a bulldog from Thunderbolt, Georgia, a great musician and a great, great herpetologist. He knows his stuff. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> proud to call him a friend. Gotcha. He can write, too. He can write a little bit. And we have another question. Is Francis Marion the closest Carolina Bay to Lexington? No, you can go right over to um, the Janet Harrison Heritage Preserve near Mineta and see it. You go down Carolina Bay Road that's in, in, and park right on the side. It's, it's actually called a high pond. A high pond they think might be a Carolina Bay in development. But since no one can clearly prove how they develop, they can't say that for sure. Lexington County has Carolina Bays. All you got to do is go, go to Google and uh, you'll, you'll see them. Go to DNR's websites too and you'll get some information there on the um, where bays are located. We've got a bunch of them in this book. I think we covered about 40 bays. Great. Uh, I made the mistake one day on Facebook saying that Robert and I had been in more bays than anybody knew. And Steve Bennett quickly corrected me because he and Dr. John Nelson went into hundreds and hundreds of them back when they were doing their landmark, landmark study. That's awesome. Well, well, thanks, Tom. I, I really appreciate you spending the, the evening with us, and it's been really informative. I'm going to turn my camera back on and, and do say some closing words. Okay. Uh, I've enjoyed it, too. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, I really want to thank you. I'm going to tell everybody, too, there's going to be an email that comes out tomorrow, 
um, that will go to your email address to everybody who attended. And, and it's going to have a little bit of a survey, but it's also going to have a link to uh, University of South Carolina Press uh, directly to the page um, where this new book is. So if you want to pick up a copy, I strongly encourage you to do it. Uh, we got copies for all of our branches here at the library, and I've, I've looked at them, and they're fantastic pictures, and it is absolutely a great, a great book. Um, so I want to thank Tom for coming. I wanted to mention a couple other, uh, a couple other programs we've got coming coming up. So Tom's going to be back with us uh, July 13th at 6:30. So um, tell your friends if you want to want to attend this program again. He'll be back with us. Uh, the friends of the Lexington Main Library are also going to be hosting uh, Kristen Harmel. She's the author of the Book of Lost Names, and that's going to be on July 20th at 6:30. We're also going to be having a, uh, a live or virtually live um, calligraphy session with Pauline Cruz, and she's a calligrapher in Columbia, South Carolina, and she um, has some some papers that you can print out, and she walks you through the, the very basic steps of what calligraphy is, and uh, so that's a fun program as well. That's July 23rd at 630. Um, so with that, I'm going to close out this session. Unless, Tom, you got anything else you want to close with? We just thank everybody for the questions and, and sitting in on this session. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. So with that, I'm going to close this session out. And uh, yeah, look out for that email. Thanks, everybody.